And we are back on the Zero Hour. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and I know that many of our listeners have been following with great interest the developments in Great Britain with the uh, election of Jeremy Corbyn to lead the Labour Party. Joining us now to discuss that to discuss that development is Tariq Ali. Uh, Tariq Ali is one of the leading voices of the British left and has been for quite some time. He uh, has written on Corbyn, calling him uh, the most left-wing leader the Labour Party has ever had. He joins us now. Mr. Ali, thanks so much for joining us. Tariq? Yes. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, great to be with you. Now, listen, you have said that uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who I believe you know, is uh, the most uh, left-wing leader the Labour Party perhaps has ever had. And uh, first of all, I guess let's start by saying uh, uh, or asking, why would you why would you consider him that? I mean, clearly, the late Harold Wilson, many other leaders of of the Labour Party domestically have been, uh, at least in American terms, what would be described as quite progressive. Uh, what makes Jeremy Corbyn uh, stand out as a leftist uh, labor leader? Well, uh, you know, one can go through them, and I will very briefly. The founding leader, Keir Hardy, was very radical at the beginning, uh, pledged to oppose the First World War, and ended up um, in the war and insisting that a senior Labour leader, Arthur Henderson, was put in the war cabinet, which he was. So from the beginning, there was a failure of the new Labour Party to break with the needs and interests of the British state, regardless of which party was in power. And after that, the second leader, the first Labour Prime Minister of a minority government, Ramsay MacDonald, broke with his party and took a majority of it to join the Conservative National Government. And the issue at debate then was a welfare benefit cuts and means testing and all this business uh, for the poor in Britain. And so the Labour Party was then left with a minority in Parliament, led by a leader, uh, George Lansbury, uh, who was a very decent guy, very sweet guy, not totally unlike Jeremy, but a complete pacifist. So he refused to allow Labour to vote for rearmament, which was a slightly weird uh, thing to do, given that the year was 1935, Hitler had been in power mm -hmm. for two years, and to make the Labour Party pacifist was not on, so he wasn't too effective. And subsequently, Attlee, who succeeded him, uh, did fight in the both the Spanish Civil War and the Second World War himself and was involved in it fully as Deputy Prime Minister and became Prime Minister of Britain after the war and pushed through major social reforms. But Labour's policies in the world at large basically led it to become an Atlanticist puppet. It supported the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It supported putting down revolts in Vietnam, in uh, Malaysia, in the Middle East, etc. And, you know, one could go on. But these were the sort of somehow the better people who led the Labour Party. The last few, uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, were basically trying to outdo Thatcher in showing how bold and courageous they were in calling all this nonsense modernization. And they helped, together with Margaret Thatcher, of course, uh, and the consensus she had established in effectively wrecking the uh, sort of traditional consensus on the welfare state. And so Blair also had succeeded in completely transforming the Labour Party so that the parliamentary Labour Party, the lawmakers in Parliament, are deeply reactionary and most of them are indistinguishable from the Tory party. You most know. of them, not all. So how does Jeremy get elected leader? He gets elected leader because his predecessor, uh, a supporter of Gordon Brown and a former member of the previous Labour cabinet, Ed Miliband, 
decides to appease both the hardcore right in his own party and the Tories by breaking links with the trades unions further and declaring that members of the Labour Party alone would determine the leader. The trade unions or the Parliamentary Labour Party wouldn't have um, any waiting inside it. And that people who were pro-Labour or had voted Labour or supported Labour, once they paid three pounds, it's about five dollars, they could register and vote for the leader's election. This was designed to basically appease the right. And this is the supreme irony that it ended up with a huge insurrection by the young in England, mimicking what had happened in Scotland last year. And they put Jeremy Corbyn into the Labour Party as its leader. I mean, he was being a member of parliament for many years, but he was now elected the leader of the Labour Party, thus opening up a huge contradiction that the most left-wing leader, and I say the most left-wing because not only are his social policies radical, his foreign policy has been very radical till now. I mean, his personal beliefs, he is not in favor of Israel and its policies. He supports the Palestinians. He opposed the Iraq war. He is opposed to military action in Syria. He's been the staunchest anti-imperialist member of the British Parliament for many, many years, very consistent, and he is now leader of the Labour Party. And consequently, we have a situation that uh, appears, at least from this distance, Tariq Ali, to be quite unusual, which is you have the leader of a party who acquired that position with, if my information is correct, the support of only 20 uh, uh, members of Parliament out of 222 that uh, that might have supported him. Is that correct, by the way? Yes, that is absolutely correct. So uh, here you have a situation where the voters uh, have, uh, with, it might must be said, some attempted interference on the party of the party leadership, have put in place a fellow who, who has uh, wide, appears to have widespread popular support within the party, but very little among the party's current power structure and elected uh, leadership. Uh, so isn't that sort of a recipe for a form of, uh, of civil war? Well, it is a recipe for that, and the civil war has started with his election. There is absolutely no doubt that large numbers of Blairite uh, rightist Labour members of Parliament are deeply unhappy and miserable. You can see it on their faces when <laughs> Corbyn is shown sitting on the front bench as leader of the opposition. And uh, many of them, when the time comes, will do one of two things. First, they'll try and wear him down, may force him to make concession after concession till he gets exhausted and leaves and says, OK, that's it. I'm resigning. Do what you will. Now, the problem if he does that is that all his young supporters who are new people, a new generation in motion, if you like, will be very upset if he does that. So who does Corbyn play to? This is a dilemma. And obviously he'll have to make some concessions, though he's made a huge one, in my opinion, on deciding to back membership of the European Union unconditionally, hmm. unconditionally. And this is the first sign of a political retreat, because that was not his position a week ago, which means that he's got some advisors who effectively pay more attention to the needs of the centre and the British state than they do to the people who elected Corbyn, and this is a very sad thing indeed. But in any case, we'll see. Maybe I'm overreacting. I may be wrong, but I'm, I am worried. Uh, well, it's but, a tendency, if I may, if I may jump in here, Tariq Ali, it's, I think it's a tendency of many people on the left to uh, understandably uh, be on the lookout whenever someone who appears to be sympathetic to the left or a member of the left, which certainly Corbyn seems to be deeply uh, uh, committed to leftist principles, whenever someone like that achieves a position of power, it seems to me I am always perhaps hyper-vigilant for signs that uh, the power structure is 
pressing them and forcing them to retreat or backtrack. I think this is absolutely true, and we can see it happening in, even as we speak. Now, if this carries on, I mean, if I mean, another key issue is ditching Trident and making Britain a nuclear-free country. The Scottish public, 80% of them, uh, want to get rid of Trident, which are based on in Scotland. Uh, all the Scottish National Party MPs in the British Parliament are against uh, Trident. So are many in the Labour Party, and Jeremy has been very strong on this question. And I think the test will come soon because the SNP will put a, a motion in Parliament asking for Trident to be dumped. Naturally, they'll be defeated because even if every Labour member voted with them, because the Tories have a majority. Right. But if they do that, we'll see which way Jeremy and his colleagues, few though they are, vote, or even middling centrist MPs who don't like Trident because they regard it as a terrible waste of money, money which could be better spent on other things. But I think that a large bulk of the Parliamentary Labour Party could either abstain or vote with the Tories on this, but we shall see. But the central point is, if Jeremy caves in on Trident, this will be taken seriously by his supporters, and especially the young who loved this particular appeal of making Britain nuclear free. It has a long, long tradition in British uh, uh, politics. So we shall see. But I think the pressure is on him, and one, you know, one feels a great deal of sympathy for him because it's not easy. It's not an easy thing being the leader of a parliamentary party, the bulk of which is opposed to you and is not even hiding the fact it wants to stab you in the front. So <laughs> we shall see what happens. And one gets a sense that Jeremy Corbyn was a bit of a reluctant warrior when it came to taking on this uh, leadership role in the first place. And and, and I wanted to ask you, uh, Tariq Ali, it, it seems to me it's an interesting moment in in global political history right now because you have uh, Jeremy Corbyn in Great Britain you have uh, the uh, the New Democrats in uh, Canada you have the rise of Bernie Sanders I should say by the way I do some work for Bernie Sanders so I always say that because it 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 indicates where I might have a bias but uh, but wherever you look uh, people who are uh, left-leaning and certainly by the standards and traditions of, the, of their country's politics quite left-leaning are are rising uh, appearing and, and and leading in the polls or doing quite well in individual locations within their countries or whatever that are, you, you can explain Syriza for example in Greece as perhaps a reaction to austerity economics and the dreadful reaction uh, of results of that uh, but but even if you do that it seems to me there's something of a leftist moment taking place is that possible yes um, it's possible and it's happening I mean the difference between Jeremy and Bernie Sanders and the Canadian NDP is that Jeremy has a very radical foreign policy right and I think Bernie's, you know, positions on foreign affairs are very traditional. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was quite shocked, uh, I, I should be straight with you, mm -hmm. that when he, when he said the other day when the his enemies were accusing of being like Chavez, he said, I'm, you know, com it's ridiculous to compare me to a dead communist dictator. And I think this instinctive response was very sad because Chavez may have been lots of things. He was not a dictator. He's been elected several times. And Jimmy Carter, who went to Venezuela on a number of occasions, said that these were the fairest elections he'd ever witnessed. So this thing about Chavez being a, a cruel dictator started off with Fox News and then was picked up by the others. And, and, and what is even more ironical is that Bernie should know that some winters ago, subsidized oil was provided to Vermont 
by the Venezuelan government on the initiative of Chavez and others who said everyone in need should be helped. Other parts of the states got this help too, so I'm a bit sad about that. Yes, so and I Bernie, by the way, uh, and I don't speak for him, and, and, I, and, and I always say that, but yeah, Bernie was, uh, I, I believe, I, I wasn't involved, but uh, I believe he's very aware of and supportive of that program. I, I think, you know, it does underscore, I think, that American politics are quite different in many ways. The climate here is very different. But that said, it seems also, you know, I, 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 the press has said that Bernie and Jeremy Corbyn have been com- communicating with one another and, and following one another's progress and so on. And it seems to me that there is uh, both... In both candidacies, uh, a broadening of political embrace of the of the left is possible. I mean, Bernie does call himself a democratic socialist, which in American politics is all, all but unheard of, and yet he's doing quite well. Um, and I think there is something also culturally or stylistically similar about uh, between. Um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn and, and Bernie and that they both appear to be people who have very little interest in or patience for the sort of Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, glamorous, well-coiffed uh, uh, political presentation that seems to have become de rigueur Look, in both is countries. That, that is certainly the case. I mean, I don't want to detract from that at all. Um, and I mean, I think myself that if Bernie Sanders, by some strange chance or whatever won the nomination that would be pretty sensational despite my own disagreements with him on foreign policy i think in terms of american politics that would represent a big big shift that the democrats have moved left on domestic issues and have taken on the corporations would be fantastic and i think that uh, the Democratic Party would draw out, in that case, a lot more voters who, if it's Clinton, will probably not bother to vote. I mean, you know, it's a strange country you, you live in, guys. And uh, <laughs> when one notices that Donald Trump is quite popular with large chunks of the electorate, you do, here, when we watch that, we just shiver, you know. <laughs> right, it's, well. not a, it's not a very pleasant sight. But... Uh, I don't know. I mean, the fact that uh, Bernie Sanders on the program he's espousing is doing very well is very positive. What all this shows, of course, is that in different parts of the world, in Europe, in North America and elsewhere, uh, people are fed up with what I've labeled extreme center politics. That, you know, you have a center, center left, center right, Republican, Democrat, Labour, Tory, etc., etc., which, when it's elected, not when it's fighting each other, when it's elected on fundamentals, on the basic fundamentals of the day, there is no difference between them. Well, right. I, I, I would only disagree. This is a response to that. Yes, and I, I guess I would only, I, I wouldn't say disagree, but uh, slightly disagree in that the, I would qualify the use of the word center because I think you find if you study the public opinion in each of these countries, they do not represent the center of public opinion on, on a variety of critical issues, especially economic issues and and international issues. They tend to represent, they lean toward the right, but they represent a kind of corporate consensus. So they're set the center of perhaps elite opinion. But this label of centrism has always uh, really annoyed me because it is uh, not accurate from a, from a public point of view. Don't you think? I think we agree on this, but you misunderstand me. I've just written a book called The Extreme Center, A Warning, which is the following, that neoliberal economics produces a layer of politicians who, whether they are formally left center or right center or center center or right, are doing very similar things. And so as you have an extreme left as an extreme right in different parts of the world, I, I said, why should these people get away with it and decided to describe them as the extreme center. And the phrase is caught on, I promise you that, and it's derogatory. It's not meant to be flattering to them in the sense that one is saying they're in the center of politics. No, that is not what it means. Well, as one who has, in my own writing, used the word radical center, uh, I think we are, although I was rightly chastised for discrediting a fine word, radical, um, 
I think we are very sympathetic. And in fact, what I'd love to do uh, is read that book and then ask if you would come back on at some point and talk about it. Sure. Happy to do so. All right, well, thank you so much for bringing us up to date and giving us a little bit of insight on the Corbin situation. I, I hope all of this is a sign that the global economic elite is going to be challenged by a new global movement, a political movement against them. And uh, we will be watching Great Britain with great interest. Thank you so much, Tariq Ali, for joining us. Thank you very much.